Hey, quickly, before we start, a couple weeks ago, I put out a video on the idol that was very heavily suppressed by YouTube due to some content not being advertiser friendly. And so it was slashed by the algorithm. And now I'm being made aware that some of you never even saw that this video came out, not even in your subscription feed. So I'm just letting you know in case you missed it, uh, go watch it. It's one of my favorite videos I've made. And I was really sad that it was hit like that, but it's there, it exists, and I think you'll like it. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay, let's talk. 2023 has been a very weird year for Hollywood. I mean, frankly, it's still being a very weird year for Hollywood. The film industry is in absolute shambles right now as the WGA and SAG are striking and quite literally fighting to have a decent livelihood. And speaking of which, I will leave you some links in the description if you'd like to learn more about the strike or donate to help the people striking. And things are just looking pretty bleak as we speak. But aside from the fact that big studios just refuse to pay the people that work for them fairly and want to exploit their likeness with AI so they can pay them even less. Yes, that sounds like a fucking dystopian movie. The other reason why 2023 has been such a disastrous year for cinema is simply the box office. And by that I mean the absolute failure of the massive tentpole movies that came out this year. We got so many big blockbuster movies in 2023. These massive projects that studios count on to make billions of dollars with the help of big franchises, reboots, and remakes. They are the ultimate money makers of the industry. Except maybe not anymore. Because in 2023, almost every major blockbuster movie that was released in theaters turned out to be a large scale flop. And the failure of blockbuster movies this year is now turning out to be a financial disaster like we've rarely seen before. And in that circle, people are very surprised and studios are kind of panicking a little bit. To put it into perspective, in the past year alone, Disney, which is under undeniably the largest film studio in the world, has lost an estimated historic $1 billion at the box office. And yes, I said billion with a B. In 2023, alone. And 2022 was also not the best year for them because a lot of their larger projects did not perform well at the box office and lost them a bunch of money. But that's one studio, and they're not the only ones to be affected. This year, all of the major film studios found themselves tanking with their biggest projects. Whether it's Disney, Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, doesn't matter. All of them have been failing in a way that is starting to make people raise eyes brows. Because at this point, this consistent failure of big blockbusters is turning into a bit of a pattern. Now, yes, it's important to note, not every tentpole movie has been a disaster. Oppenheimer has been really successful, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was also a notable hit this year, and Barbie has been so ridiculously massive that it's been breaking a series of box office records and broke the billion dollar mark at the box office in just two weeks. This movie is a fucking titan. Super Mario Brothers was also a billion dollar movie, the only other one to come out this year, and John Wick 4 and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse were giant hits that made their respective studios a lot of money. But as you probably noticed, or as you will soon discover, these movies are a big, big, big minority compared to everything that has come out in 2023. It's just six movies in the entire roster of blockbusters that released this year. Everything else was kind of a flop, which is astonishing, by the way. This year has been a series of major movies performing terribly and way below expectations. Needless to say, studios have been losing insane amounts of money. but. Why? Why are Hollywood blockbusters failing? Like, what's going on? Because honestly, it's been happening way too much for it to be a coincidence or a fluke. This year has made it very clear that we are at a shifting point where these huge movies are not as profitable as they were just a few years ago. So yeah, what happened?
What happened? Well, I think there are three specific reasons why this year turned out to be such a massive financial disaster for Hollywood and why it will keep being like this in years to come if things don't change. Because, yeah, things things definitely need to change okay let's go number one blockbusters are too expensive to make now this is the easy and obvious reason and you'll see why it's so obvious later in the video but yeah Duh. There's been a lot of confusion over the past maybe eight years over why major studios made a habit of dumping such an insane amount of money in their projects. Because it doesn't make sense. The reason why this is such an issue is simply that with the amount of money put in certain projects, it no longer makes sense in the grand scheme of things to attempt to be profitable at the box office. Let me, let me explain why. Let me give you the quick math. See, because of various financial reasons linked to their deals with movie theaters and investors, etc, etc, it's estimated that in order for studios to break even on a movie they put out, that movie has to make around 2.5 times its budget at the box office. 2.5 times. So to put that in practice, if your movie costs $50 million to make, it has to make $125 million at the box office for you to break even. If it makes under that, even if you make, I don't know, $90 million, while you're actually losing money. For the example, that's why a lot of DC fans were confused last year as to why Black Adam was considered a box office bomb, and many thought those were lies because the movie definitely grossed more than its budget, so therefore it can't be a flop. Well, yeah, it can, and it is. Why? Because Black Adam had a reported budget of $260 million, but it only grossed $393 million at the worldwide box office. Meaning, Warner Brothers actually lost millions of dollars with Black Adam. This movie was not profitable at all all. Just because it made more money than its budget does not mean that it's a successful movie. So you're starting to see what the problem is, right? In the last decade, studios have been inflating movie budgets to such an insane degree that it's turning into financial suicide. It's become so common to hear about blockbusters casually costing $250 million, if not more, that you now have to make unbelievable amounts of money just to break even. Not even to make a profit, but just to break even. This problem is caused by every studio desperately wanting to replicate Marvel's financial success. They watch Marvel having a streak of billion dollar movies at the box office and whoop! Executives have dollar signs in their eyes and they want the same thing. So they think, oh, they put a lot of money into their movies and make a lot of money. So bigger budget equals bigger returns. But no. Say what you will about Marvel, because they kind of suck right now, but they were smart with their approach. Marvel had the buildup. It made sense for them to put $300 million into Avengers Endgame. They built up to it through a series of mega successful movies during a 10 year period. It was a calculated risk and of course it paid off. The movie made almost three billion dollars at the box office. But here's the thing guys, you're not Avengers Endgame. Your movie is not Avengers Endgame and your movie is not gonna make that much money. Case in point, even Marvel themselves are starting to struggle at the box office with how expensive their movies are. Like guys, when you have to make 700 million dollars at the box office for your movie to break even, there's a fucking problem. And I'm not even being hyperbolic here. You'll see later in the video because I'm going to talk about it, but we are getting to the point where movies that have made over 700 million dollars at the box office 
failed to break even and i honestly think it's ridiculous it's fucking ridiculous studios are looking real dumb right now and not just because of the strike they are being so greedy and so trigger happy around the idea of having billion dollar movies like marvel that they don't realize how stupid the business model they created is especially because when it comes to blockbusters number two there's too many of them. Staying on the topic of greed, let's talk about how studios decided to overplay their cards with audiences with the fun little concept that is quantity over quality. Here's a quick question for you. Do you know why blockbuster movies are called blockbusters? That's because back in the summer of 1975, when Steven Spielberg's Jaws came out, it became such a gigantic pop culture phenomenon that thousands upon thousands of people would line up in the streets everywhere in America to get a chance to see the movie. It was a literal blockbuster because the lines would be so long that they would continue on several blocks. People had never seen that before and that phenomenon then happened again in the summer of 1977 when the first Star Wars movie came out. That completely changed cinema forever and that is when these big summer movies became known as blockbusters and they were very special and precious to audiences and the industry. Here's the thing though. The reason why they were so precious is because they used to be so rare. Back in the day and up until like the mid to late 2000s, you would get like two major blockbusters a year. If you were lucky, gigantic box office shattering event films were just that event films things that would just happen once in a while and get people excited because they were the big events of the year at the movies they were legendary and they blew up at the box office because they were few and far between. But in the last 10 to 15 years, notably with the arrival of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, movie studios completely shifted their focus to big franchises and in their eternal greed, they have spent the last decade changing the landscape over time by filling their release schedules with a never-ending series of blockbusters. They want all of their movies to be massive event films and they are now releasing them at any time of the year and if you don't believe me you just have to look at this year in 2023 in march alone we had creed 3 screen 6 shazam 2 john wick 4 and dungeons and dragons coming out literally five massive event films being released in the span of four weeks are you really surprised that people didn't rush out to see all of them broski broski and by broski i of course refer to hollywood broski escucha the math is simple if every movie that comes out every week is a major event film then there is no such thing as a major event film. The overwhelming majority of people are not going to go to the theaters five times a month. It's just not happening. So your big blockbuster is not a blockbuster anymore. It's just a $200 million movie that's never gonna make its money back. There's just too many blockbusters for people to keep up with, and that's a problem. People are just not going to watch all of them, which directly leads me to my next point, number three. The pandemic has changed audiences' habits with the movies. Yeah, shocker, things have changed since COVID. People do not go to the movies as much as they used to, and also, people do not want to go to the movies as much as they used to. Why? Look, it's a very simple equation. There's more and more blockbusters coming out every week. These movies are getting more and more expensive to make, but audiences are becoming more selective with the movies they pick to go see in theaters. You get how that math ain't mathing, right? You get how that's not a winning formula. 
right? Because yes, these movies are getting ridiculously expensive to make, there's way too many of them coming out, and because all of the parties financially involved in making these movies and releasing them want to make a profit, movie tickets are also getting more expensive. You want to, I don't know, take your significant other to the movies? Yeah, that's gonna cost you like $40 just for the tickets. And if you're having popcorn and a drink and maybe a pack of M&Ms, I don't know, I like having M&Ms at the movies. Well, now you're probably looking at a $65 bill for a night out at the movie theater. Do you really expect people to do that five times a month? In this economy, my guy, that's $325 going into it monthly for the movie theaters. That's psychotic. Obviously, people are gonna be picky with their movies. You can't blame them. It's the most logical thing in the world. So now what's happening is, because every single week of the month has a major blockbuster coming out, if not two, audiences are going to pick one, maybe two of them to go see, the more exciting ones, and all the other ones are going to flop because they were way too expensive to make and they would need to make fucking, I don't know, $600 million to break even. This business model doesn't work. And 2023 is the ultimate confirmation that this blockbuster focused vision of the film industry was never going to work out in the long run. It was a delusional idea. And if you ask me, this outcome was inevitable. And you know what? I'm going to make this super fucking clear now because we're about to take a look at the 10 biggest box office failures of 2023. Big blockbuster movies Hollywood was proudly putting out in the hopes of making billions but ended up crashing and burning spectacularly leaving the studios in a ditch and trust me there's a lot to say but before we get into that let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is a massive online community where you can learn pretty much anything you want. I know a lot of you guys ask about my editing or about my directing on music videos and let me tell you, Skillshare is exactly where you want to go for that. It is an infinite pool of knowledge. There are literally thousands of really interesting classes for curious and creative people about pretty much anything you would like to explore or any goal you would like to reach. You want to learn about illustration? They got it. Web development? They got it. Social media management? They got it. You want to figure out how to write a good script? Well, there's a class for that too. Like anything you can think of, it's there. Personally, one of my big goals this year was the goal of achieving a better work-life balance because work has become a very, very large part of my existence and I want to be able to find a good middle ground to be present in other aspects of my life. So it's been really helpful to discover the productivity and time management classes curated by Skillshare to help me figure things out. I'm also fascinated with animation and I've been thinking more and more about making my own and this class by Danny Fisher Shin has been the perfect starting point I've been looking for to get into it. Honestly, no goal is too small with Skillshare. You can find a class to learn anything. And you know what? You guys are in luck because the first thousand people to use my link in the description will be able to get a month free trial of Skillshare. You can go and explore the platform and learn about anything you want for an entire month for free. And I mean it, anything you want, the whole thing will be at your disposal. So this is your chance to go and explore any topic you're curious about. So make sure to click the link in my description, join Skillshare, and start learning. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. You guys are the best, and let's get back to our movies. All right, we are locked and ready. So now let's talk about the 10 most notable box office failures of 2023. Starting with number 10, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. This is a great one to start this list. 
And before we even start, first of all, just to get it out of the way, Mission Impossible 7 is great. It's a really good, really well-made action movie. This franchise is just constantly innovating and finding new ways to keep itself engaging and exciting, and it succeeds at that every single time. There isn't a single movie in this franchise that I dislike, even Mission Impossible 2, which is widely regarded as the weakest entry in the series. It was my brother's favorite movie growing up, and we only watched it about a hundred million times. And then I wasn't allowed to watch Dragon Ball Z because he wanted to watch it again, and so we had to sit through two hours of, of fucking Tom Cruise with long hair, and then in masks, and then a whole lot of fucking the, the motorcycle fight, and the fucking- And now we are 27 years after the start of the franchise, and I'm still having a lot of fun with it. I had a great time with this movie. It's not my favorite in the franchise, but it's definitely up there. These movies are always improving in a lot of ways, but for some reason, despite their huge popularity, this last one didn't do well at the box office. Now, to be clear, this movie is not exactly a flop yet. It is still in theaters, but it is a very noticeable disappointment and it is pretty clear that it will not be a highly profitable project if at all. Which is crazy to think about for this franchise. Dead Reckoning Part 1 wildly underperformed at the box office, in a way that left a lot of people in the industry quite puzzled. Not only did it get a weak domestic opening weekend with $52 million, which was already below expectations, the movie also suffered a surprisingly massive 64% box office drop in its second weekend, which heavily impacted its earnings. Now, now, while that sounds catastrophic, it's important to note that Mission Impossible has always done really well overseas, and Dead Reckoning's only saving grace seems to be its international box office, which really came in to balance the scale here, but I'm not sure this is gonna be enough to make it a winner. There's no way around it, this movie is just not doing well, and it is currently the second lowest earning movie in the franchise, right behind Mission Impossible three which came out in 2006. At the time of recording this, uh, Dead Reckoning is sitting with $522 million at the box office, which would be outstanding news for a lot of movies, but given the fact that the estimated budget of this film is somewhere around $290 million, and given the fact that the studio likely put another $100 million in marketing, it wouldn't be crazy to think that Mission Impossible 7 becoming profitable for Paramount is not looking like too great of an endeavor right now. It's doing okay next to some other movies in this list, but I think we can just admit that Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is definitely not a success. Now, um, for some reason, I assumed that the upcoming Dead Reckoning Part 2 was gonna be the final movie in the franchise, so I thought, okay, well, maybe it'll generate some buzz and the franchise can go out on a high note as one of the most memorable action franchises in American cinema, or something like that, but turns out, no. Tom Cruise apparently said very recently that he intends to make Mission Impossible movies until he's too old to make them. So I have no idea what the future of the series looks like, or if the disappointing box office of Dead Reckoning is the start of a real decline, or just bad luck for being released at such a weird time and just a couple weeks ahead of Barbenheimer. But either way, uh, this sudden shift in the franchise's box office return and overall popularity is just not a great sign. Which is more than I can say for the next entry in this list, number 9! Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Shazam! Okay, I'm gonna be completely honest. I kinda hate that this movie is on this list. And I don't even like this movie, but I hate having to put it here because I am a massive fan of the director who made it, and I want to talk about him for a second. If you don't know, the director of both Shazam movies is David F. Sandberg this guy, who also directed Annabelle Creation as well as Lights Out, which to this day is still considered by many to be the greatest horror short film of all time.
And the reason why I am such a big fan of David, aside from the fact that I like most of his projects, is simply because of his online presence. If you don't know, as well as being a big shot Hollywood director handling like huge superhero movies, David is also a YouTuber. And he has been on YouTube for like 17 years. He has a channel named Pony Smasher where he used to make animations and now makes videos about his filmmaking. He actually was noticed by Hollywood after making that iconic Lights Out short and posting it to his channel and he became this super huge director after he was approached by a studio to adapt Lights Out into a feature film that came out in 2016. But the thing I adore with David is that even after becoming a superstar who directs massive Hollywood blockbusters, he never left YouTube behind. To this day, he still uploads videos whenever he can. He talks about his journey as a filmmaker and he opens up a lot about his struggles of being the director of such big movies with such large crews under his command while being a very anxious introvert who doesn't do well socially. Sometimes there are issues and obstacles, like the last day of shooting Shazam. We wrapped and I was asked to say a few words in front of the crew and I just could not do it. It was just one of those days. So I didn't say anything. Uh, I went home and felt like an asshole. I couldn't even say thank you to the people who had worked their asses off on this movie. Instead, I wrote a letter that was sent out to everyone. That was my workaround for that. And something that I'm still not a fan of are movie premieres. They're supposed to be a celebration. Yay, we finished the movie and now it's gonna be out in the world. But I always kind of dread them because I know I'll have to get up in front of everyone and do a little speech. I'm very envious of outgoing people like Zachary Levi, who seemingly can get up in front of people without prior notice and make a speech, just like that. To me, that's like magic. He also shares behind the scenes and tips on his movies to help other filmmakers improve their work. And even though he now makes big blockbuster movies with hundreds of millions of dollars involved, David never stopped making horror short films for YouTube. He's still making his little home movies. And he doesn't have like a large crew and insane resources for these shorts. He's literally just making them in his house with his wife. They're his little passion projects and like little ideas he wants to get out of his head while having fun. And the best part is, all of his horror shorts are fucking amazing. He just released a new one like two months ago and it's just as good as the shorts he made like nine or ten years ago around the time he made Lights Out. And every short film he releases is followed by a detailed breakdown of how he shot it. Like his channel is just a gold mine of hands-on knowledge for filmmakers. I I love it. He just seems like the biggest sweetheart and I respect him so much for never ditching YouTube as soon as he got a foot in the door in Hollywood. At the end of the day, David is just a guy who is super passionate and nerdy about cinema and I'm a big, big fan of his. Anytime he has a movie coming out, I am here to support it, but I also have to be honest about my feelings on things I watch, so you can imagine that it really pains me to say Shazam! Fury of the Gods is just not it. I really wanted to like this movie. I found a lot of enjoyment in the first one and I like the cast a lot. So I was excited to see them in action again, especially with the addition of Rachel Zegler in the sequel, as well as two fucking legends of Hollywood, Lucy Liu and Helen Mirren. However, I started getting a little worried with the trailers, which I found to be particularly bland and surprisingly uninteresting. Now, trailers aren't always an accurate representation of what a movie is gonna be, we all know that, but like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like my spidey sense just started tingling. Something was off with this one. And unfortunately for my own ass, uh, I was right. Regardless of how much I wanted to love it, I have to be honest, Shazam 2 is not a good movie. It's just kind of a boring drag. It has a tedious, generic story, generic characters with very weak motivations and very weak storylines, and a wonder Woman cameo that is so forced that it feels like a Saturday Night Live skit. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It's not the worst movie I've ever seen by any means. I think some people made this movie sound way worse than it actually was. Like, it's not unwatchable or anything. It's just extremely forgettable, underwhelming, and again, unbelievably generic and unfunny. Everything about this movie you have already seen in other movies that did it much better. And between the negative reviews, the bad word of mouth, and the half-assed marketing campaign it got prior to its release, there was absolutely no world in which anyone was going to be interested in this sequel. And yeah, the numbers just kind of confirm that. Shazam 2 bombed really, really hard at the box office. I think at the time of recording this, it's estimated that it lost Warner Brothers around $150 million. And that's just fucking insane. People cared so little about this movie that the studio decided to throw it on digital like a couple weeks after it came out. It was an absolute financial disaster. And aside from Zachary Levi having a fucking meltdown on social media over people not going to see the movie, everyone who's in it seems to feel like they weren't too satisfied with the movie either. Rachel Zegler flat out admitted that the only reason she did this movie is because she couldn't find another job and she needed it. It's not like she was passionate about it. Even David F. Sandberg himself doesn't seem to like how the movie turned out. On the opening weekend, he literally said he knew the movie was gonna bomb a long time ago, and then he just tweeted that he's done with superhero movies, which honestly is kind of cool. I'm dying for him to go back to horror. But yeah, just in general, big yikes. Basically, this movie was a disappointment for everybody involved. The audience, the actors, the director, and the studio. And given that it came out during this very awkward time that marks the end of the DCU as we know it, feels like this letdown was almost inevitable. I don't think people could have had high expectations after Black Adam, and DC in general has just been having a very difficult time getting the audience's trust back. I already feel bad for Blue Beetle. This movie never stood a chance. Anyways, let's move on. Number 8. Transformers Rise of the Beast. I'm a peaceful little monkey. <laughs> This one is just funny to me for some reason. The Transformers franchise is probably the blockbuster franchise that makes people roll their eyes the hardest. It's just everyone seems to be so over it. I mean, it's always been a massive question mark for a lot of people because it seems like literally everybody hates these movies, but they also made just absurd amounts of money at the box office. And they pretty much dominated the blockbuster genre for like a while. That said though, after the fourth movie, Age of Extinction, came out in theaters in 2014 and made a billion dollars by the way, there was a very sudden shift with audiences that got really tired of Transformers. 2017's Transformers The Last Night, the final Michael Bay Transformers movie, was a major box office disappointment. Bumblebee came out a year later and also disappointed at the box office, even though the movie itself is kind of fun. And then the franchise took a bit of a hiatus as Paramount Pictures tried to find a way to restart the franchise and give it a new life. And so, five years and one pandemic later, we finally saw the release of Transformers Rise of the Beasts, a sort of sequel to Bumblebee that also acts as a soft reboot of the franchise that retcons some of the previous installments. And, uh, oh boy. This movie was supposed to be the grand return of the Transformers franchise in the forefront of pop culture like it was in, like, 2009 or 2010. Which is fucking hilarious because it is insane how nobody gave a fuck about this movie. Like, nobody cared. This shit came out and... Crickets! I mean, to tell you, I didn't even realize this movie was out until I started working on this video. I was hearing so little about it that I just thought it was gonna be released later this year. But turns out, no. This movie came out two months ago. 
I didn't know that. And given the box office, I don't think a lot of people knew that. Because yeah, uh, in terms of box office, things have not been looking very good. It made $429 million, sure. But it made that on a $200 million budget. And that's not even counting marketing. Broski, that's not good at all because remember for a movie to break even at the box office it needs to make about 2.5 times its budget and keep in mind that's not even to be profitable it's just to break even that means if rise of the beast costs 200 million dollars to make it needs to make around 500 million dollars at the box office just to break even just to make sure that it didn't lose money. That's half a billion dollars. So I can tell you right now that Transformers 6 did not make any money. $429 million at the box office on a $200 million budget is not a win. It lost money. It is currently the lowest grossing movie in the entire franchise. And yes, that is including Bumblebee. I did watch the movie a couple days ago, and while I didn't think it was the worst thing ever made, I totally understand why nobody really cared about it when it came out. I understand why the people who saw it were not particularly buzzing about it. Rise of the Beast is the most aggressively average movie I've seen this year. It is mid in the middle of the realm of mid. A lot of it is really boring and empty, it's extremely forgettable, the characters are lame and mostly annoying the script is ridiculous and repetitive like the story of this movie is just a lesser version of the already shitty story of the previous movies it does absolutely nothing new everything works with an insane amount of conveniences that make the stakes non-existent it's, it's this this movie sucks it sucks it's a bad movie also liza koshi is in it that has nothing to do with anything, I just thought I'd bring it up. You get it, it's just a mediocre film that doesn't exist for any other reason than Paramount would like franchises. I think it's the kind of movie you see and then as soon as it's done, you just immediately forget about it. And... Um... Wait, what was I talking about? Number 7, The Little Mermaid. Oh boy. So, a couple months ago, I made a video titled Tired Franchises Hollywood Refuses to Let Die, in which I went on an extensive rant about how one of my biggest pet peeves in modern cinema has become unescapable. And that pet peeve was the Disney live-action remakes franchise. An endless series of movies where Disney is essentially takes all of their legendary classics that made them a household name and then just remake them, but not as good. An idea that just sounds really dumb, because it kind of is, but that somehow made them billions of dollars because these movies have been super successful for some reason. I mean, until very recently, that is. The last big theatrical release in the live-action Disney adaptation was 2021's Cruella, which underwhelmed at the box office and didn't break even. Disney Plus then released the live-action Pinocchio and Peter Pan and Wendy, which were both flops, and now we are back to a major big-screen release with The Little Mermaid. And, oh uh, boy, it did not do well. And you know what? I didn't even hate The Little Mermaid remake. I thought it was very okay. It's fine. It's whatever. Does it hold a candle to the classic animated movie? No, it doesn't. None of these movies hold a candle to their originals, except maybe for Jungle Book. This movie is fire. But even though I thought the movie was okay, yet forgettable, yet okay, and Halle Bailey is a fucking superstar who absolutely killed it as Ariel, I watched this movie constantly asking myself, why? Why, why did we need this? Why? The answer is we didn't need it, but I couldn't help myself but ask anyway. And it looks like I wasn't the only one asking this question, because The Little Mermaid was a pretty big box office disappointment. Audiences were not at all willing to run to the theaters to watch this one, which is kind of a growing trend with Disney, but we'll get to that later. Now, to be fair, uh, The Little Mermaid didn't exactly bomb, but it barely managed to keep its head above water. It 
barely broke even, and some reports still speculate that it might have lost Disney an estimated $20 million, which isn't that bad compared to what some other movies on this list have lost, but it's still a solid dent in the wall, especially for a movie that you just know Disney was expecting to make a billion dollars. And I think this movie is the best example of a big Hollywood project that cost way too much money for no reason. The Little Mermaid had a budget of $265 million without marketing. And I have one question for you. Why? Why on earth did Disney throw out so much fucking money into this movie? And I know some people are gonna say it's because of the CGI, but I'm gonna call bullshit on that a little bit. I just mentioned the Jungle Book remake. This movie is literally all CGI. Mowgli is the only real thing you see on screen. This movie is so packed with expensive things for a big production, and it costs 175 million. It's already a fuckload of money, but why on earth does The Little Mermaid cost almost a hundred million more? And all of that to look worse. It's the most expensive remake they've made so far, and I just don't get why. If they hadn't inflated this budget so much, this movie could have actually been profitable a little bit. It's, I just, ugh. I just don't get what they're doing. Anyways, you get the point. Let's move on. Number six, Elemental. You're so hot. <laughs> yep, we're sticking with Disney. And believe it or not, uh, there are more to come in this list. This one is going to be quick, though, mostly because like most of you guys currently watching this video, I didn't even see this movie. Elemental is yet another massive L for Disney, and it's one more entry in a series of financial disasters for Pixar, which, if you don't know, has not been doing well for a while now. And Elemental is a movie we've been hearing about for a very long time. It was very much introduced to audiences as being Pixar's next big thing, kind of like we had seen in the past with the likes of Inside Out or Coco. Unfortunately though, uh, that didn't exactly work out. And when I say Elemental is the latest entry in Pixar's series of failures, it's not an exaggeration. As of right now, it seems like Pixar is the major studio that has had the hardest time recovering from the pandemic, and all of their attempts at coming out with a massive hit has just crashed and burned with little to no returns. Onward was obviously very impacted by the pandemic, because it came out just a couple weeks before the entire planet shut down, and it lost Disney a whole lot of money. Same goes for 2021's Luca, another massive commercial flop that I believe was the lowest grossing movie in Pixar history at the time it came out. Turning Red was sent straight to Disney Plus, certainly losing Disney millions and millions of dollars, knowing that the movie barely made anything and had a budget of $175 million. This movie is really good, by the way. And of course, one of the most unexpected failures for Pixar was 2022's Lightyear, a movie they were certain was going to be a smash hit, but ended up falling so flat that it ended up losing Disney an estimated $106 million according to Deadline. That's fucking crazy! And now, the follow-up to Lightyear that was supposed to get Pixar back on track is Elemental, which came out in June to a disastrous 29 million opening weekend, which got everybody real worried real quick. Headlines started coming out with people from the industry starting to ask if Elemental was the confirmation of Pixar's downfall, with many doubting its ability to ever recover from the pandemic. But, 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 the big twist with Elemental is that despite its awful, 
awful launch, the movie did have legs and it ended up earning more money than expected. Like it's definitely not going to be one of those movies to lose a hundred million dollars, but it also was not the ultimate smash hit they seem to believe it would be. Right now it's not even clear if the movie broke even, given the fact that it had a 200 million dollar budget. And if it did break even, it really did it by the skin of its neck. Almost there. So yeah, not a total failure, but a massive disappointment nonetheless. At this point, it's very difficult to say what the future of Pixar looks like, um, but I think, I think they're really gunning for a huge financial hit in 2024 because they're releasing Inside Out 2 in the summer. I have no idea how this movie is going to perform. I think they waited way too long to make it, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Number five. Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves. I'm at the Another quick one, but one that I absolutely wanted to mention. And before I even start, yes, I know. Dungeons and Dragons feels like someone at Paramount watched Guardians of the Galaxy and was like, oh, can we can we just redo that, but fantasy instead of sci-fi? Like this movie wants to be Guardians of the Galaxy so bad, but you know what? I don't care. This movie's fun. I liked it. It's such a fun ride that like pays attention to a lot of details linked to the DND game and lore while not taking itself too seriously at the same time. It's not like a fantastic movie by any means, but it was a good time. The trailers already had me hooked. I was really into the vibe the movie was offering and I was really hopeful that it would do well because one, we don't talk about the first D&D movie. And because too, it's just a fun little adventure movie with actors I really like. But yeah, um, let's just say Dungeons and Dragons is still in a dungeon. That was a bad pun, I'm sorry, I'll stop. Because this movie didn't do well. It didn't crash face first into the ground, but it still flopped in a way that was very noticeable. Now, to be completely honest, it was never going to be a big winner though, given the fact that it had a massive budget of $150 million, but mostly because it came out and had to compete with the releases of Super Mario Brothers, which made well over a billion dollars at the box office, and the highly anticipated John Wick 4 a fucking massive smash hit that overshadowed any other movie available at the time of its release. I would also add that the movie had a really underwhelming marketing campaign, which probably didn't help. It's not very clear how much money this movie lost. Some reports say it is somewhere between 50 and 100 million. I can't say for certain, but the good news is, despite its failure at the box office, a report came out last month pretty much confirming that Paramount is still looking at making a possible sequel, so it may not completely be doomed. But yeah, um, not much else to say about this one, so next, number four, Fast X. Here we go! I don't think this is gonna surprise anybody. I think it's okay to say we all saw this one coming. And it makes sense. This is just a classic case of whatever goes up must come down. The Fast and Furious movies reached their peak in 2015 with Furious 7. And since then, both on a critical standpoint, an audience reception standpoint, and on a box office standpoint, the franchise has only been met with diminishing returns. Now, yes, the movies have still been making a fuckload of money until now, apparently. Yep, it finally hit the threshold during that slow descent. To make it simple, Fast X is the ultimate confirmation that the Fast and Furious franchise is officially past its prime, both in terms of financial returns and in terms of popularity. And it's a big problem for the studio because if you don't know, these movies are very, very expensive to make. And now you're thinking, oh, another $200 million movie. Uh-uh. Nope. I don't think you understand how expensive these movies are to make. Fast X alone had a budget of $340 million. 
dollars. And that's before marketing, which means you can add another 100 million for good measure. For context, this movie was more expensive to make than Avengers Infinity War. I think right now it is the eighth most expensive movie of all time. So yeah, despite the fact that it made about $700 million at the box office and is currently the fourth highest grossing movie of 2023, we still can't consider Fast X a success because it didn't actually break even. Do you see what I'm saying now? And I think the main reason for that is simply that the Fast and Furious franchise has outlived the meme. The dumb fun element of the movies that made people like them so much has kind of run its course. Like it's reached that all right we get it point. There's only so many times you can watch Vin Diesel defy the laws of physics or give his cheesy one-liners while Tyrese makes the same jokes over and over again and Ludacris spends an insane amount of time trying to explain the most bullshit science you've ever heard about. Like after a while it just gets a little meh. The action can be fun but over time it just turns into noise. It kind of blends into the non-stop chaos and it gets boring. Again it's something that you look at now 11 movies in and you're just like all right we get it. Like we've done this before, it's gonna have to end eventually. People did not lose their minds over Fast X, it just kinda came and went, and while people enjoy Jason Momoa as this over-the-top flamboyant Joker villain, and I actually liked him too, he was really fun in this role, the movie overall just kinda fell flat, and I don't think it's only because it's a bad movie, because most of the Fast and Furious movies movies are fun bad movies. Everybody knows they're bad movies but I never stopped anybody from enjoying them. But I think it's also because we've kind of seen everything there is to see with this franchise. We've been at it for 22 years my guy. It's getting old. The excitement is just gone. Like I wouldn't be surprised if the box office numbers continue to drop like they have consistently been dropping for the past eight years. Exiting the box office a quarter mile at a time. <laughs> okay, next. Number three, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, look. <laughs> this is a bit of a special case because this movie doesn't stand on its own when it comes to its failure. Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania is kind of the inevitable fruition of a long streak of shitty Marvel projects. It's no secret that Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was an absolute disappointment that largely took the form of a boring mess with no real direction. Added to the fact that it just had way too many entries with a total of 7 movies and 8 TV series in only 2 years with 2 Disney Plus specials thrown in the middle, the majority of which turned out to be overwhelmingly disliked by audiences, it was inevitable that one project would eventually come along and break the camel's back. And Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is that project. It is the movie that finally made everybody admit without the shadow of a doubt that Marvel is experiencing a pretty severe downfall. I think most people were aware that things had not been the same since Endgame, but this was the final nail in the coffin for the fandom as a whole. Because it's been four years since Endgame and so far, despite never having released so many projects, the MCU has has completely failed to give us any reason to remain invested in this saga. Now, to clarify, is Quantum Mania the worst MCU movie? No, I wouldn't say that. It's definitely one of the worst, but not the worst. So if we've seen worse from the MCU, 
Why is it that this movie in particular left audiences with such a bad taste in their mouths? Why does it feel so off to people? Sure, you could say that it's because it's the first movie of Phase 5 and we expected it to truly step the game up, and there's definitely some truth in that, but I have a little theory. I think this movie really rubbed audiences the wrong way because while Quantumania is not the worst MCU movie, it is definitely the most corporate MCU movie to date. What I mean by that is that this movie truly has no soul. It doesn't feel like it exists for any other reason than the fact that it was on Marvel's release schedule. It doesn't have a reason to exist. Like, you could say its purpose is to introduce Kang the Conqueror, who is gonna be the successor of Thanos as the big bad of the multiverse saga, but no? Kang was already introduced in Loki. I would have understood if Quantumania was going to introduce a version of Kang that was going to become the big ultimate final boss that the Avengers would face, but, um, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, that's also incorrect. Because the Kang from Quantumania dies. He's literally insignificant in the grand scheme of things. This movie has no reason to exist. The characters in the movie barely have a reason to be in it. Literally, this movie is titled Ant-Man and the Wasp, and neither of these characters can justify their own existence in the story. Scott doesn't even have an arc in his own film, and Janet is barely in the film. It's just, watching Quantumania is a very hollow experience. It feels stale and forced. You can feel that this project was only made to make more money for Disney, not to further the story of these characters in any capacity. And yes, Marvel has been feeling like that since Endgame, maybe at the exception of WandaVision and Guardians 3, maybe Shang-Chi, but I think the reason why Quantumania sticks out so much in terms of disdain from fans is because it is by far the project that is the most unsubtle with it. This is the the most boring and soulless MCU entry to date, a very blatant realization of how the people at Disney and Marvel have taken these fans for granted since Endgame. And again, it's not the worst MCU movie, but it is the most corporate one. You can just feel that this movie was made by a giant corporation following all of the cliche guidelines to make a blockbuster hit, and it failed, by the way. After the huge disappointment that was Phase 4, Marvel fans are no longer willing to run out again and again to support MCU outings, which shows, because Quantumania is now officially a box office bomb and lost an estimated $125 million at the box office. A huge, huge flop that probably makes it Marvel's biggest financial failure to date. And I I, for one, am not surprised one bit. Let's move on. Number two, Barbie, I'm kidding. Number two, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Elderly potheads. Why did it have to be elderly potheads? Okay, I'm gonna be super honest right now. I'm not sure I understand why this entry surprised people so much. While I understand how something like Mission Impossible left people scratching their heads over the disappointing box office, I just don't get why anyone thought Indiana Jones 5 was gonna be a big thing. This is probably the film on this list that I am the least surprised about, and I didn't even hate this movie. I thought he was fine. Not great, I, definitely not great, but I, it was fine. I like Indiana Jones. I saw the original trilogy for the first time as a kid, like most people, and I've always been into it. I wasn't particularly looking forward to this fifth installment, and I know it was quite divisive, but I saw it 
and it was all right. That said though, while I liked it just fine, I am absolutely not surprised to hear that this movie bombed really fucking hard. Like I said, I'm surprised people thought it wouldn't. See, the big problem with Indiana Jones that I think the big execs in Hollywood never understood is that compared to big franchises like Star Wars that have also been around for 40 plus years, Indiana Jones never really managed to modernize itself. And what I mean by modernize itself is that it never really found a way to speak to a younger audience. And, um... Uh, okay, I'll just say it how it is. The Indiana Jones audience is old. That's it. That's the primary reason. It's a franchise that just doesn't speak to young millennials and Gen Z. It just doesn't have an appeal to young people. Most fans of Indiana Jones are over the age of 35, and within this group, I'd be willing to bet that a majority of them are 40 years old or older. It's very much a product of its time, and it's very much an American thing. People outside the US don't really give a shit about Indiana Jones. Maybe they did like in the 90s, but broski. Indiana Jones's pop culture status has not been up there in a very long time. But my theory is that I think because Hollywood is mostly ran by old men who don't really understand modern audiences, they believe this movie would be a smash hit without having considered the fact that millennials and Gen Zers currently make the bulk of film audiences going to the theaters and that there is absolutely no interest in Indiana Jones coming from them. There was no real hype for this movie. The excitement was mainly reaching American men over the age of 35. That's it. And by the way, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. You can totally make movies having an older target audience in mind. That's not an insane thing to do. But if you're gonna make a movie targeting 40 plus year olds by banking on nostalgia, then Dude, maybe you don't spend 300 million dollars on that movie, because obviously you're not gonna make that back. This movie cost 300 million dollars. 400 million with marketing. And I don't know what they were thinking because it was kind of obvious that they wouldn't be able to count on international audiences either because Indiana Jones lost its status a long time ago. And also because the last time they tried to make an Indiana Jones movie, they made a movie so bad that some people are still not over it 15 years later, there's absolutely no sugarcoating this. Indiana Jones 5 is a box office disaster. It is a bomb and a big one. Especially when you consider the fact that it cost 300 million dollars to make. I think they thought this movie would have the same hype as a Marvel movie and pull in like a 120 million opening weekend without flinching. But like, Broski. Nah, man. Dial of Destiny opened way below expectations with only $60 million domestically. And so far, it has grossed just over 300 million in its entire run. This movie could turn out to be one of the biggest flops of all time. They are gonna lose hundreds of millions of dollars. Indiana Jones 5 is a financial disaster of an unseen scale. And again, I'm not surprised one bit. I have no idea why Disney was so convinced this would be a billion dollar hit. It makes no sense. I just, I cannot shake just how disastrous of a year Disney just had at the box office. They had six major releases in the first half of 2023, which is a lot. Six big projects that they were banking on to turn a major profit for them. Billions of dollars of revenue. And out of those six movies, only one of them was successful. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. All of the other movies on their roster this year flopped and flopped spectacularly. Little Mermaid barely managed to break even and might have not even achieved that. Ant-Man 3 crashed and burned, losing $125 million in the process. Elemental barely kept its head above water and 
ended its run on the verge of losing money, and Indiana Jones 5 is now expected to lose so much money that it could place itself in the top three biggest box office bombs of all time. Oh, and that's not even mentioning the recently released Haunted Mansion, their sixth big project of the year that also brutally crashed at the box office. It barely managed to make $60 million in its first three weeks in the cinemas, which is an absolute catastrophe given the fact that the movie had a budget of 150 million. This movie is gonna lose so much money, it's insane. It's at this point, there's just no denying it. 2023 has been an astronomical failure for Disney at the box office, and at this point, it's not a coincidence. Their final major release of the year, I believe, is gonna be The Marvels, which is coming out in November. And I don't think this movie is gonna be very successful given how Marvel's popularity is down in the gutter right now. I think it's gonna perform about as well as Ant-Man and the Wasp's Quantum Mania, but even if by some miracle this movie is successful, it still won't be even close to enough to save Disney's catastrophic year at the box office. And Disney is very well aware of that because CEO Bob Iger recently announced that he plans to reduce the number of major Disney titles coming out and he plans to severely cut down the amount of money thrown into these projects. Everybody says that audiences talk to Hollywood with their wallets and it's seems like this time, the message was clear and loud enough to actually scare them. I am very, very curious to see what the next couple of years are going to look like for Disney, because they just got slapped in the face with a billion dollar wake-up call. <sighs> Anyways, now that we're done with all the Disney stuff, let's move on to number one. The Flash. <laughs> All right. Here we are. I know a lot of you guys have been waiting for me to talk about this movie since before it even came out, so now I'm gonna do it! The Flash is easily the biggest anomaly of the year in terms of movies. This is by far the weirdest project on the list for a number of reasons. The downfall of The Flash, believe it or not, is a train wreck that was almost a decade in the making. Yeah, a lot of people forget that, but this movie was announced nine years ago. Ezra Miller was cast as The Flash and had their movie announced in 2014. To put it into perspective, it was announced on the day the second episode of The CW Flash aired. In that time, The CW made nine seasons of the show. This movie was announced when Game of Thrones was in its fourth season. How I Met Your Mother was still on the air when this movie was announced. This movie was announced when I was 19 years old, and I am now 28. The movie was initially set to be released on March 23rd, 2018. Yeah, this thing is five years late. And the worst part is, by the time 2018 came around, they didn't even have a script yet. So now you may ask, why did this movie take so much time to happen? Well, this is where things get a little insane. If you don't know, The Flash Movie is a project that has been plagued with behind-the-scenes issues from day one. It was just a never-ending series of conflicts between creators, actors, studios, directors that just stuck the project into a loop. The Flash went through six different directors who all walked out of the project over creative differences. Differences. Phil Lord and Chris Miller, the directors of the Lego movie, the 21 Jump Street movies, or more recently the Spider-Verse masterpieces, were attached to write and direct the movie, but the studio kept trying to change their vision, so they eventually left, opting to join Disney to direct Solo A Star Wars Story instead. Which, by the way, is fucking funny because they were eventually fired from that movie as well, 
because Disney and Lucasfilm did not want to respect their vision. Then, it was Seth Graham Smith, the author of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, who joined the project in 2015 and was set to write a new script based on Lord and Miller's treatment, as well as direct the movie. It was gonna be his directorial debut, but he ended up leaving the project just six months later, again, due to creative differences. After that, it's Rick Famuyiwa, the director of Dope, that clocked in to direct the movie. It's reported that he was brought on because Warner Brothers believed his unique vision would resonate better with a younger audience. So he joined the project in June of 2016, and the announcement of his involvement got people really excited because he's an excellent director. He reworked the script to be more of a body cup movie where The Flash was going to team up with Cyborg, but lo and behold, Rick ended up leaving the project just four months later in October because the studio didn't agree with the more mature approach he had to the story and they were not willing to budge. And so after that, the movie was put on hold and taken out of the Warner Brothers release schedule. Fast forward to January 2017, it was announced that Warner Brothers decided to completely reimagine the film and scrapped all of the work that was done over the last three years. They then hired a new writer named Joby Harold and ordered a page one rewrite of The Flash. Oh, and for the record, Joby Harold is the guy who wrote Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Oh, and he also wrote the Obi-Wan Kenobi series that came out last year. So... This gives you an idea of where we're going with this. After he rewrote the movie, Warner Brothers decided to start looking for a new director, which was an absolute fucking mess because after all that drama, nobody wanted to touch it. They pitched the movie to Robert Zemeckis, the director of Back to the Future, Matthew Vaughn, director of Kingsman, Sam Raimi and Mark Webb, both directors of Spider-Man movies, and every single one of them turned it down. Jordan Peele was then offered the movie and he said no and they even tried to attach Ben Affleck to direct the movie but he also opted not to do it. It's only a year later, in March of 2018, that they got new directors to join the project. John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, the duo that later would direct Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, which we talked about earlier in this video, joined the project and picked up pre-production. Everything was going steady until Ezra Miller decided to put themselves in the middle. Ezra was reportedly unhappy with the vision of the directors and they decided to to rewrite the movie themselves with the help of Grant Morrison, an extremely loved and respected comic book writer who notably wrote All-Star Superman, which is considered by many to be the single greatest Superman story ever told. However, Warner Brothers was happy with the current version of the movie and was not particularly interested in Miller and Morrison rewriting it. So they decided to only give them two weeks to rewrite the whole thing and pitch it. And Ezra stated that if this fifth version of the movie didn't satisfy the studio, they would walk out of the project altogether. By this point, the movie had been in development for five years, so people were getting kind of annoyed. Ezra and Morrison reportedly reinvented the movie as a more simple time travel flick heavily inspired by Back to the Future, but Warner Brothers was opposed to it because they absolutely wanted the story to touch on the concept of the multiverse. Once again, nobody agreed, so the studio rejected the script a couple months later and John Francis Delaney and Jonathan Goldstein left the project immediately after. Somehow though, Warner Brothers managed to keep Ezra Miller in their role as The Flash. Come on now, dawg. Come on, man. So, in 2019, back to square one, the studio hired a new writer, Christina Hudson, the writer of Bumblebee, to write a brand new script. And a few months later, Andy Muschietti, the director of It, joined the project with his sister and they started pre-production in January of 2020. And this would end up being the team that made the movie we actually got to see. <sighs> oh, uh, but we're not done. That's not where the problems stop. Because it is only then, when they finally figured their shit out after six years in development hell, that the next problem appeared. And that problem was... 
Ezra Miller, who for some reason is not in prison yet. That whole situation that we've all heard about continued to plague the movie and it got to the point where Warner Brothers actually considered not releasing The Flash due to how bad things were getting. And let me tell you, it would have been a wild move on their part because they spent $200 million making this thing, but that just tells you how messed up the shit Ezra Miller was doing was. Like, it was so messed up that it almost convinced a major corporation ran by greedy businessmen to throw away $200 million. Basically, they went back and forth for a very long time until they gave Ezra an ultimatum to calm them the fuck down. As we all know, Ezra Cave did the public apologies, and now we haven't really heard about them since. And they haven't faced any real repercussions for their actions. They even got to attend the premiere of the movie. America, fuck yeah. And then, after all this fucking nonsense, the rumblings started to be heard. Rumblings coming from industry insiders who had gotten a chance to see The Flash in various stages of post-production. And let's just say their reactions were pretty wild. We started hearing everywhere that The Flash might just be the greatest superhero movie ever made. There were talks about how, despite the endless drama and chaos behind the scenes, Andy Muschietti managed to come through with an absolute masterpiece of a film that was going to blow away literally everyone. Even James Gunn, when he came in to run the new DCEU, told everyone that he'd seen The Flash and he said he also was flabbergasted and he also called it one of the greatest comic book movies of all time. We even heard at some point that Tom Cruise had seen the movie and like allegedly he was so impressed with it that he personally called Andy Muschietti to like work with him in the future or some shit like it was wild people were talking like this was the second coming of christ they were hyping this movie up like it was the greatest piece of cinema to come out since the godfather people could not have been more excited or intrigued and then the movie actually came out and here's the thing when i first came out of the theater after seeing the flash i was like huh I think I liked it. I was still feeling underwhelmed because of how much people had been hyping it up before it actually came out, so I think my expectations were way too high. And for an obvious reason, I have also grown a particular distaste for Ezra Miller that was somewhere in the back of my head the whole time, but I didn't hate myself watching it. However, as time went on over the next few days, the more I thought about the movie, the less I liked it. And now, as it stands, I don't think I like this movie very much. I, I, I changed my mind. There are things about it that I like. It has its moments here and there, but overall, as a whole film, I think The Flash is kind of mid and kind of forgettable. Honestly, the story is just kind of whatever. It's just a severely dumbed down version of the Flashpoint Paradox, which is a fantastic comic book that this movie loosely adapted. And yes, the movie looks fucking ugly and the story is so not memorable or impactful that the cringy CGI seems to be all people can talk about with this movie, which is understandable because frankly, it makes absolutely no sense to me that a movie that costs $220 million with 2020 three technology can look this bad. Realistically, it's probably because they didn't give the artists enough time to finish their work properly, but still. Look, there are some things to like about it, okay? Michael Keaton's Batman, fucking incredible. I absolutely loved him in this movie. That one joke when Barry tries to run but has lost his powers made me laugh out loud. It's a very funny callback slash response to people who criticize the way The Flash was running in Justice League. Sasha Kaya's Supergirl was absolutely fantastic, though very underused. Used. I really, really hope that we get to see her again. Like, yeah, the movie has its little perks, but like overall, 
eh. And yes, everybody has said it already, and I will say it too. The third act of this movie is just straight up awful. It's so bad. It's such a terrible finale that feels so empty, and there are so many things about it that are just so stupid plot-wise. The big villain of the movie is so lame, the way the conflict is resolved is so lame, and like I said, in the end, I find the movie to be very forgettable. It's not the worst thing the DCU has ever made, like it's not Suicide Squad or Wonder Woman 1984 or the Joss Whedon Justice League, but it's still a mediocre movie. But with all that said, Saying The Flash is a failure is probably the biggest understatement I've made in this video. Because The Flash didn't just fail. No, no. It fucking crashed. It crashed into a crater and then got beat up by a million gorillas. Like, this movie is a disaster like we've rarely seen before. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me put it into perspective for you. The Flash is now the biggest comic book movie flop of all time. Let me say that in another way for you because I don't think you understand the scope of what I mean. No comic book movie in the history of cinema has bombed harder than The Flash. I want you to think of all the major superhero movie flops that have come out over the years. All the embarrassing failures that people made fun of like forever. Think, think about them. Fat Four Stick did better than The Flash. Catwoman did better than The Flash. Green Lantern did better than The Flash. Black Adam did better than The Flash. New Mutants did better than The Flash. And actually, you know what? Scratch all of these. I got even better. Morbius did better than The Flash. Morbius, my guy, it's Morbin Time, a movie that came out in the theaters and flopped, and then Sony tried to re-release it in theaters a few months later, and it flopped again. A movie that was memed into oblivion so badly that even the actors in the movie started to mock it too. Literally the biggest joke in the film industry did better than The Flash. Make no mistake here, The Flash is a failure of historic proportions. It is estimated that this movie has lost Warner Brothers well over 200 million dollars. In the history of cinema, there is only one film that has lost more money than The Flash. It's Disney's 2012 catastrophe, John Carter, which also lost over $200 million in nominal numbers. The Flash is a train wreck. And this movie failed for a number of reasons. One, the immediate reaction from general audiences seeing the movie, creating some mixed word of mouth. Two, a lot of people decided not to see this movie to stand against Ezra Miller, and a lot of people are just kinda tired of superhero shit. Like, when you have a new superhero movie every month, you're not rushing in the theaters to see all of them day one. But even with all those very valid factors, the way this movie crashed and burned at the box office is just so embarrassing. And Warner Brothers is very aware of it. The other day I came across a headline that read, Warner Brothers is reportedly too embarrassed to release The Flash on streaming. And I'm sorry. But that's fucking hilarious. And yeah, by the way, I'd be embarrassed too. You took an entire decade to make a movie going through six directors because a bunch of suits think they know better than the creators they hire to create, and all of that to release a mid-movie starring a fucking criminal who was literally on the run after being exposed for repeatedly assaulting women in public and allegedly 
and kids and you stood by them and supported them and brought them in full glam to your premiere all in an effort to make money off of this thing you crossed so many moral lines just to make money and you failed miserably so yeah warner brothers i'd be embarrassed too uh, anyways, I'm done talking about this shit. There you have it. 10 of the biggest box office flops of 2023. A surprisingly bleak year for the film industry. Everyone is losing right now. The WGA and SAG are fighting for their future. Again, links in the description if you'd like to learn more about that. The studios are losing so much money. It's ridiculous. Like, it's just not a winning year for this industry. And I think 2020 is a pivotal year for the future of cinema. I think in the next few years, we are going to see some major, major changes in the landscape. Things are about to change, and I just hope they're gonna change for the best. Anyways, go watch my idol video. It's really good. You're gonna love it, I promise. But if you know, you know.